let me int introduce our special guest here. This is Hiroshi Okamoto. He's a member of the AIA and he is an LEED accredited professional who graduated from Cornell University with a Bachelor of Art Architecture degree and from MIT across the river here with a Master of Science degree in Architectural Studies. Uh, from 2001 to 2012, he worked with I.M. Pei on the Museum of Contemporary Art. Everybody in Boston knows I.M. Pei. And uh, he was a designer and construction administrator for the Museum of Islamic Art and project architect uh, of the chapel at the Miho Institute of Aesthetics in Japan. Uh, he worked on I.M. Pei's last project, um, which was that um, uh, Institute of Aesthetics. Uh, from 2008 to 2012, he was an independent design consultant and the design architect and project manager uh, for the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, where in collaboration with Richard Serra, he designed a cantilevered stone pier for Serra's uh, sculpture. In 2010, he, not that long ago, he co-founded OLI Architecture, and he's been the design principal and project architect for the Museen uh, Art Museum, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, and the Chengdu Silk Art Culture Museum and the Museum of Islam Islamic Art Renovation. He's done numerous other notable projects, and we're actually we're thrilled to welcome here welcome him here tonight. Uh, he's going to make a presentation after which we'll be able to do a Q and A program. Uh, so you can use that Q and A feature to line up uh, questions and uh, the chat feature if you'd like and we'll come back to you after the presentation. Hiroshi? Yeah. Okay, shall I share my screen? Share your screen, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry about the delay. We've had some technical difficulties with Peter and the, um, so we're gonna start and hopefully there'll be some time, maybe Peter can join us a little bit later. But uh, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our office, OLI, and our history and philosophy before I get going on a couple of our projects, which aptly fits into the title of this talk, Architecture for Art as Art. Uh, the two projects I'll discuss are the Mushin Art Museum, which is built in 2015. It's a single artist museum uh, that was uh, located in Wuzhen, which is outside of Shanghai in the canal town of Wuzhen. And then the London Cross Pavilion, uh, which houses uh, a Richard Serra sculpture called London Cross, uh, that was completed at the end of 2019. A much smaller building, but uh, very interesting as well. So before I go on, just a little bit of a background of, about ourselves, Tony was kind enough to introduce me and um, we've actually yes we formed our company about 11 years ago uh, before forming our practice my partner and I worked on worked for IM we cut our teeth working on signature museum projects cultural projects uh, as Tony said I was involved in Doha the Museum of Islamic Art which was better part of eight years uh, being on site as well for uh, a few years. And then my partner, who is my counterpart in the Sujo Museum, he was the project architect there. Um, that was completed in 2006. So subsequently, we launched our practice. And of course, launching our practice, it takes time um, to get established. And as we were doing that, I actually worked with IMP on the Miho Chapel, which was his last project for one of his former clients, the Miho Museum client. And then I also was the designer of the Peninsula Park behind the Museum of Islamic Art, and that's where I met Richard Serra. So I'll talk about that project a little bit, but um, although we've done quite a few cultural museum projects and within our 11 short years, uh, our projects started to range from institutional projects in healthcare, hospital, and schools, but also we do smaller scale projects, custom residences, and retail. And the thing about all of our projects, I think there is a common theme. Uh, it carries through all of our work, one that not only focuses on the conceptualization of the project, but also through the entire process from coordination and documentation, um, which incorporates collaborating with the varied consultants and engineers, but also the fabricators 
and then the numerous stakeholders. Sometimes they're very different as the client and user, the local government, and of course the community for which we built or we designed for. So uh, this is what we consider the design project. Um, no matter how small or large of a project, the scale or the budget, um, it is something that runs through our, uh, I guess, our design ethos in our practice and so the two projects um, tonight vary in scale quite quite a bit but are good representatives of this project or this philosophy so peter is here peter is here with us let's say hello Hi, peter we... greetings everybody congratulations carry on hiroshi i'm glad i'm glad i can see this i'm glad you can <laughs> you've been to the museum so the mushin art museum uh it's a single artist museum, as I, des uh, I described. It was for uh, Mushin, who is not only a painter of abstract landscapes, but he was also a writer, a poet, a philosopher, a composer. Uh, he actually even designed his own clothes and made his own clothes sometimes. Um, so he was very much a Renaissance man. He was, he was gay. He was very learned, um, came from a relatively well-to-do family, uh, lived in this canal town in Wuzhen, which is about an hour and a half out of Shanghai. His uh, father tragically passed away when he was very young, uh, but he spent his time in this canal town, a lot of time in the library, voraciously reading everything there, from uh, classic Eastern philosophy and literati to even any Western classics that he could get his hands on. And some of these images you see are some of his ink art paintings, but uh, he's very much well known more for his short stories. And uh, he always wanted to be a painter, but his actual um, publications are what he's the most well known for. But in the most recent kind of um, uh, time after the museum, which gained a lot of popularity and exposure to him, a lot of his works not only his writing, but his uh, paintings and ink art have become well known. So, and during the Cultural Revolution, um, as with most intellectuals, he was incarcerated um, the first time for about 18 months in what they call people's prison in Shanghai. And then under house arrest after that. Um, this is in the, I believe in the 70s, early 70s. And, uh, during his incarceration, he would secretly write short stories and letters to his favorite authors. And these would also not only be Chinese famous authors, but also to his favorite Western writers. So from Toy Story to Nietzsche to uh, Shakespeare, Oscar Wilde. Uh, he, and he would take these confession papers or these papers that were meant to write, he was meant to write confessions, uh, confessions every day. And he would secretly write these little stories or letters pretending to have conversations with these famous people that he admired. And this was not only a way of him saving himself, um, but in physically confined space, but this is a way of him expanding his own space, creating space and mental space. And this is something that impacted us when we first saw these prison notes as they're called. Uh, there's about 66 sheets that survive. They're written on both sides. And half of the, uh, the prison notes are at the Yale University at Art Gallery and half are now on display in our museum that we designed. And so he would actually write these notes and then roll them up and sew them back into his prison garb so that they wouldn't be confiscated or discovered by guards. He wasn't supposed to be writing. Of course, this is the a cultural revolution, um, but they survived and we went to see him uh, the first time my partner first saw him, Mushing, um, originally actually in 1982, immigrated to the States and I believe it or not, to Jackson Heights, Queens. And there he became a mentor and a friend to a diaspora of young generation of artists from China who had immigrated as well. And he held informal classes. Um, every week and he taught Eastern and Western literature, art history, philosophy. So he's very much a mentor to these young artists. And some of these young artists have since be moved back to China during the economic boom in the 2000s until now, become very famous acclaimed artists themselves, household names. And one of them is the director of our museum, Chen Dan Ching, and another artist, Du Dan, some of you may know, uh, who we met through working with Ian Pei, 
uh, championed the project. And we were approached by them, as well as the head of the Wujian tourism industry to design the Mission Museum uh, in his honor. Um, we were actually fortunate enough to first meet him, but he, this, is, this picture was, was in spring of 2015. Uh, no, spring 2011, I'm sorry. And then he subsequently passed away, unfortunately, in December of 2011. But we had a couple of times where we were able to meet, which was really fortunate. Um, this was at his house in Wuzhen that was built for him near his childhood home um, in celebration of his life to bring him back to China as he was failing in his health. And he always, he wanted to move back and look at his childhood home. So, uh, and when, before he passed away, uh, I guess those two meetings that we had, we had shown some sketches and ideas, but um, talking to him, he spoke English, but he didn't really let it on. He pretended not to, um, but he had some words. He's, most of the meetings were in Chinese. I don't speak Chinese, but you can really feel his character. Um, he had a really uh, cheeky, self-deprecating humor. Um, his, his house was always dark. Actually, he was kind of a night owl. And he would take us to his studio, which is this beautiful table, really long wooden table. And he would do these ink drawings, but the drawings were very small. It was almost like he was confined still physically. Um, but the drawings, as you see in those examples, are scaleless. They're, they have this abstraction to them. Um, but he was very much a person of the East as well as the West. And he was kind of like a bridge. And that was a, a central theme as well as what we were trying to do. And so. Mushing was a pen name. Um, his, it actually in Chinese characters means wood heart, literally, or true heart, um, figuratively. And the one thing he told us when we started and we met him um, and we showed him some sketches and early renders was he said, let's not be afraid to make mistakes. And that kind of liberated us going forward. So, uh, the town is a quite beautiful town, Mujin. Um, like most of our projects, we do a lot of contextual research and site research. Uh, it's in the, uh, it's a canal town about an hour and a half away from Shanghai, closer to Suzhou. If you, if it, any of you know that Yangtze Delta area, it's part of the Grand Canal system, which was originally made um, thousand, a couple of thousand years ago that ties Beijing to Hangzhou or the winter and summer palaces. And this town was successfully restored, um, well-managed, and uh, has become a very uh, popular destination, scenic backdrop for filming. A lot of tourists come um, quite successful in this kind of restoration and reuse. So. Um, as you can see here, these are pictures we took when we were visiting. And so we were really um, doing these contextual kind of fabric studies and local construction methodologies and studying the site. One of the things that we kind of noticed and we loved about the canal and these back alleyways and these um, very small two-story overhangs and uh, you get these glimpses of the canals is that these interior streets were bustling, the canal was bustling with boats, um, but we also had these small public courtyards and breaks to see the canal or little gardens. And instead of the space that's measured by the distance and proximity to something, the canal, which is kind of the lifeline of the development of the town and the economic generator, um, really was a separator as much as an expander of space because you were either separated from the water or connected via access to the water over a bridge and et cetera. So this is very much something we took to heart as well in trying to create something of a smaller scale. We wanted to, we knew that we wanted to abstract the actual building. The town of Wujian became very successful and the head of the tourism industry, which was our client as well, decided to allocate a new area for cultural projects. One of them was um, a Chris Yao Grand Theater. There's another project from uh, Wang Shu, the Pritzker Prize winner that did a convention center. Uh, but it, we're connected by a body of water and it was a sh very short boat right away. And you can actually see the town from our building. But um, this is like one of our first, very first sketches and the idea of the bridge separating from the bustle and the tourists, tourists and the visitors of the town to a quiet world, another world, a world of Mushing. 
And what we wanted to do was create these intersecting volumes of experiences of Mushin, which was his poetry or his art or his writing, or even a library of his favorite books. And we wanted to slow the speed down and allow the visitors to wander, um, create their own narrative of Mushin or their own um, knowledge of Mushin. Uh, their books and audio, as well as some of the materials that he made, as well as his paintings. And it was for the visitors to navigate through the experience in the museum. So the wandering aspect was really something that was interesting to us, as well as this kind of breaks of frame views and glimpses of the landscape that would reorient you to the context. Um, so, and we quite literally, these, this is like a first render we showed him. Uh, we quite literally started pasting, scanning and pasting a lot of his landscapes on the landscape and also on our building. And we wanted to kind of have this evocative feel um, on this material that we, we thought we should be concrete, uh, but also allow for uh, a rougher construction, knowing the methodologies there. A lot of the buildings are masonry, daub and wattle, plaster and tile. So there's a lot of stone and tile with wood framing. Uh, we wanted to use the wood as the formwork for the actual concrete, but we wanted to allow for these lift lines, these mistakes, this kind of textural elements that carry through the actual building, which is quite minimal in some sense, but also abstracting and uh, connecting the experience of the inter interior and exhibition. So. Uh, subsequently, we developed more further and further. These are images of some of our final presentation. Um, the building is actually 60% underwater. So it's a three story experience in the museum, but it's actually a two story building out of the water. So the scale was really important for us being in close proximity to the old town. Um, but as you can see, this is actually the basement, the majority of it, the hatched area is the public area, the white area is service, conservation, other elements, as in most museums. Um, but the first floor is where you come in through the bridge. And as you can see, there is a series of volumes from the entrance lobby to an introductory gallery to the first painting gallery. You would go up and experience uh, another gallery as well as the prison notes and then wind your way down and a library of his favorite books coming back through uh, a literature gallery of his actual short stories. And then uh, actually another floor down back into the basement where all of the actual temporary galleries were as well as a cafe and a reflecting pool. So it's quite meandering and you were allowed to actually recreate um, paths or skip areas. Um, but you, we very much wanted the idea of expanding space through the experience and allowing for your own speed of experience to navigate through the museum. And then, as you can see, the volumes above the water, that's the roof plan. Sectionally as well, you can see a lot of the actual building is on the ground. Um, the expression of the facade was very important to us. Uh, architectural concrete is something that we wanted to use. It's a very honest material. It's a material that is structural as well as actually the finish. Um, this is something I was very familiar with working with Ian Pei on several of his projects. Uh, form, it's formwork, pattern, coloring, uh, concrete mix, of course, is very important. It's something that uh, once you pour it, it is what it is after it cures. So there's no touch up or usually it's more beautiful when you don't touch it up um, or try to correct it. And the key is really in the preparation, the specification, the testing, and really a lot of extensive field work and CA work. So we had um, a secret weapon, I guess, or someone who I worked work for, work with before Reg Huff, um, he was, uh, Mr. Pay's concrete person for a long time, and then subsequently he created a, um, a pretty successful consultancy for architectural concrete. He worked with Tadao Ando on several buildings, the Clark he may have gone to, or with 
uh, Zaha Hadid, some of these projects are also his projects. The Clifford Still Museum was something that inspired us as well. He worked on that as well. That, that concrete work was really beautiful. Um, and so within that, also talking with, that's Chen Danqing in the middle there, my partner, Lim Ding, myself, having meetings back and forth, always involving the client. Um, it wasn't only just about the corn shell, but really about the narration or the curation of the contents, contents and having that immediate input from the beginning as a stakeholder so that he would be involved and take ownership of that responsibility was really important for us. And we try to instill that in almost all of our projects. So, um, so these meetings and as we develop the project further and further, we generate um, just a little more visualization so that we'd be testing our ideas. Uh, this is of the lobby entrance, uh, the prison notes that, that I discussed about a little bit more of a confinement, darker brooding, lower ceiling area. Um, the table that was in our memory from visiting his studio and being one-on-one -on -one with his actual paintings or his artwork was really important. So our initial idea was nothing on the wall, only on the table. And that was that was a whole museum, essentially, at the beginning. And so, and of course, other areas like the, the reflecting pool with this kind of waterfall and the cafe. Um, and so those visualizations help, but Actually, the more important things in some ways is really the CA work or the field work. For almost all of our projects, especially our significant projects, we always try to work with the client to have someone on the, on the site full time. Um, and this is actually a picture of our site. Uh, they had cleared it and filled part of the actual site. There used to be a little apple orchard on the side. Behind me is actually a dock and the actual canal that they were holding back. Um, and in this project, we had two full-time site representatives and essentially trading off at times, but overlapping at really the height of the peak of the construction. This is where we have that bathtub and the basement, which is the 60% of that building coming up and before the architectural concrete work. So, and of, of course we'd make a wooden model or a model for the site office. Everyone would be able to see it. You can actually take it apart. Um, is another visualization for the contractors and the client and the stakeholders and the actual project project management team. So, and part of our ethos, as I said, is this kind of uh, CA work that involves everyone. And we started to, through our past experiences, we always try to specify mock-ups. So we made this small actual mock-up building that incorporated almost every detail we thought we would encounter actually in the museum. So everything from different finishes and thresholds to uh, stairs, guardrails, openings, glass, um, steps, these were all incorporated into this little kind of, uh, I would say it's about five by four, five by three meter building. Um, and we wanted to create different pore conditions, even round columns that we would have, and inside outside corners, um, water, uh elements and actual kind of hidden doors as well and air slots etc so um which was you know it was quite helpful it's a it's a learning tool it's an experimental tool it also gives the contractor as well as the the construction management team more confidence in what they're doing what they're seeing they start to see the logic of a lot of our actual drawings and documentation and the design intent and then they actually start to also take ownership, start to suggest things, um, try to cut corners sometimes, of course. Um, but overall, it is this collaborative effort that starts to happen. And this kind of mock-up as the construction is going was one of the best things that happened for us. The contractor is very local, uh, has never done architectural concrete. And so, and not many contractors do, so almost every project we're on where we use something like this, it's always a learning curve. And a lot of it also deals through the specifications, mock-ups. This is Steve Eisenman from Reg Hub's office. He would come, we would go and look at the different batch plants. We would talk about the different concrete mixes. 
uh, the different aggregates and plasticizers and admixtures. And we would start to make these small little mock-ups of form and color. So these were kind of color mock-ups with C30 concrete, different concrete strengths, but also mixing in um, coloring agents like titanium oxide, a little iron oxide. The issue about white cement, titanium oxide, or white concrete um, in Asia and China, Japan, a lot of places is banned to be used as structure because the heat of hydration uh, controlling the heat and controlling the curing is a little bit difficult. Um, it's not it's not that difficult, but it takes care in terms of choosing the right mix. And um, you induce cracks a lot or you get cracks. So in China, it's not allowed to be used as a structural concrete. Fortunately, if you um, in the concrete world, depending on the region, similar to the Yangtze Delta, the concrete is very light gray because of the aggregate, the cement mix and the sand that we use. Um, and that's, you know, depending on where you are in the US, you may get red concrete or darker concrete because of that kind of sourcing. So, uh, so going through, we slowly gear up, start making larger mock-ups and inside outside corners, um, testing our ideas, working out even tie rods and form work. And as the construction progressed, we started on the mock-up building. And as you can see, it's very local construction. Um, we created rules and um, kind of like a game rule of how the construct, how the boards would be lined up. Everything was on a module, even these little equipment switches, um, exit signs, everything had a rule of how much it would be inset, what would be the reveals, et cetera. So, and it's a lot of documentation, but it's also a lot of logic. Um, and so that it was not something that was overwhelming once you started to read into the actual project. And we would test out different coffer systems that we would use. Um, and then, as you can see, we would even have someone test out using the same boards to match through one of the access panels, that access doors that we would have. Um, and so this is the mock-up building. We did the interior mock-up as well. And uh, during these times, we also look at the mistakes of our design and try to improve it and try to catch it as we go along in the construction of the building. So, and so first mock-up, a lot of our projects, we do a first mock-up and usually on the building, it would be a uh, first in-place mock-up. It would usually be a discrete place that not many people would go to. If you make a mistake, that would be the place you would want to make it. Um, so this was towards the back end by the administrative wing. Um, and uh, again, using this kind of form work that was actually divided into a 30, 60, 90 module. So everything always lined back up at a 300 module, so a foot. Everything on the building was actually modulated vertically in 3D space as well as in 2D in the plan. Um, you can see these kind of fiberglass tie rods that we started using in areas where we didn't have that much pressure and kind of these crack inducers, these are stainless steel inducing, micro crack inducing um, elements that we'd introduce to actually make cracks where we want them to relieve the stress of actual concrete. And so we would not have construction joints on the facade. Um, but, you know, concrete work is concrete work, and concrete cracks, of course, um, but it also is a very honest material. So this yellow pine that we selected, it's a very soft wood. Um, we actually wet, we would wet the pine or we'd have someone wet the pine and actually someone grind through. And this looks like a fire hazard, but in the end, we would get this amazing texture on the actual boards. And this is actually the concrete that you're looking at on one of our boards. So. Um, and the building progressed. It, there was a time when people were like, what are we doing? Are we sh are you sure concrete? The client was a little nervous at the beginning. They were asking, should we make it into stone? We we're like, let's trust the process. And I think that was the key where we had people there as well as the specification, the logic of the system the idea of the actual design and, and kind of the experimental nature as well as kind of um, not being afraid to make mistakes in that way, I guess. So. 
so some images as we were constructing of the walls. There was actually a logic to these in and out. We, we wanted to give a soft lift. So the actual in and out actually became more pronounced as you went up. It's a very subtle thing, but you actually feel it. And then on the inside, you actually, we had a more quiet um, actual concrete expression, except for at this entrance lobby that you see here. Um, and you saw that first render from before. Um, yeah, and you know, we're quite happy. We're quite blessed. This is one of our first major commissions. We had a couple of small things going on, but um, uh, I think it was through some of the experiences prior uh, with IMP, but also understanding and feeling about the actual nature of the construction there, what we wanted to do, allowing for some mistakes. There are certain things that we see that we made mistakes and being able to adapt. Re redesigning some shutter systems or, uh, or elements that we can catch it. And yeah, this is kind of where we ended up and uh, we were quite fortunate. Um, the client was always on board after the initial kind of hiccups, very supportive, um, quite hands off except for some of the display elements. And, um, you know, um, it was a very successful partnership and collaboration, I think. So. Um, this is a view of one of the painting galleries. We, we didn't want anything on the walls, but in the end we decided, um, we uh, agreed to actually put some things on the walls. As you can see, these paintings are tiny. And we always felt that it should be almost a one-on-one -on -one experience where your these cases also contain these, on the table contain paintings. And it's almost like you have to be on this table, almost at a studio to experience his paintings. So. This is the, the prison notes, 33 of them, you would see. Uh, and the literature gallery of his short stories. Um, yeah, and so images of the actual completed building. And so, oops, sorry, that was an abrupt end. So I'm gonna go and talk a little bit differently about actually a wood building, uh, much smaller. Um, it's actually a pavilion, as I mentioned, uh, houses a sculpture, a significant sculpture by Richard Serra. Um, this is a project completed in 2019 at the end of the winter, going into uh, the spring. Um, it's up in Westchester, uh, in New York, and it's for a private collector who's a significant collector, a very prominent collector of contemporary art, or actually a different types of art. And, um, but before I go on, I just wanted to backtrack a little because I first met Richard Serra in 2008. And this is when this is the Museum of Islamic Art. I don't know if some of you may have been to Qatar. Uh, this building finished in 2008. Um, and we were still kind of working our way into the peninsula. And for some reason or another, we we actually had several designs that never came to fruition on that peninsula and it was kind of not completed. This building was actually um, uh, built on land, which was near, um, there was a, actually a reclaimed kind of port. Um, and it was selected by IMP because it was in the old city looking at the new city, which is just expanding rapidly. And um, when I first met Richard, this is at the end of the project, the client had asked I Pei to suggest an artist to commission a significant piece of art for the museum. And I am Pei suggested Richard Serra. This is, I think when I was working on this museum, the Richard had a retrospective in um, MoMA 2006. That was a huge retrospective. Um, and I know Mr. Pei went there and looked at it and he was, he was a big admirer of Richard Serra. So I was tasked with the task of bringing Richard Serra there, trying to avoid him from suggesting a place that we didn't want him to place the sculpture, but um, trying to find a way to actually commission something that would be a substantial addition to the museum. And he first mentioned that let's put it on the entrance bridge or these courtyards. and. We kind of convinced them that it should be at the end of this palm, uh, palm alley, this promenade, and looking back towards the museum as well as as a backdrop of the actual 
um, city that was forming. And so the idea of this project, we first, um, I, I was actually approached by Richard to help him. IMPA was about 91 at this time. And so retired out of doing anything in Doha. So I got the commission to be the designer of this park as well as to help him on the pier. And the pier is a simple parallelogram. Uh, it juts into the water cantilevering off so on one side, it's actually a wind, uh, wave break. On the other side, it creates this kind of stadium step that goes into the water. And as the tide rises up and down, and then you have this view of back of the museum. So I think that was kind of the genesis of um, our relationship with Richard. When we got this project for the London, London Cross Pavilion, we didn't know what it was. We were first approached by the Gugosian gallery and we're told the significant collector wants to build a significant piece of uh, build a uh, building for a significant piece of art so we weren't tr we're trying to figure out what and we later found out it was Richard who uh, recommended us I think he recommended us because we work with him probably heightening his piece without actually interfering with his piece um, this is a picture of the London Cross in the gallery in, uh, in the Gavosian in London. And also some pictures of his projects that are very site specific. This is another project in Doha he had uh, done right after the seven project. And of course you guys know Bill Bell. Um, this is probably one of the earlier pictures because they subsequently added onto it and the matter of time is eight pieces in that room. But uh, knowing Richard and the space, it was a space that maybe compromised the experience of those pieces. Um, you know, we, we all know there's a famous kind of back and forth with Frank Gehry and Richard Serra. Um, but we looked at his artwork and some similar things. This is an earlier prop piece, a um, little bit smaller, but we knew that we wanted to be very respectful. We were prescribed the actual gallery. The gallery in London was a temporary gallery built inside of the gallery. So the box was there. And, but we were told that from there, we had to make a building, the, the materials, um, and as well as the lighting effect and then the actual outside envelope and the environmental controls. Um, so we brought this crude model out to the estate with Richard and uh, we looked at this site. We wanted to figure out where, where it should fit. Um, for Richard, he's he actually, as a preeminent artist of our time, one of our preeminent artists of our time, he, he has very strong contractual language on any of his pieces where he has to okay how the piece is situated. He has the right of first refusal whenever someone wants to sell his piece. Um, he, he's the one who asked us and recommended us to do, for this commission. So, um, you know, we went out there, it was funny stories. I actually had been picked up by him and his wife in a big SUV. It was a hot spring day and climbing up into the SUV, I ripped my pants. So the whole day I was wearing a sweater around my pants, walking around, trying to measure out the actual pavilion. And Richard would be like, go over there. What do you think over there? And I'd be like, oh, maybe. And I'd be slowly walking backwards like a crab. So. Um, but that was a, a fun day. And so we picked this site on the, on the bottom of the hill. Um, there are other significant Richard Serra sculptures nearby. Um, and this is a sketch we did after, uh, but we knew that this orientation and the natural lighting was going to be very important for us. We saw the, the, the actual installation. Um, they built the box and then there was a skylight that was kind of off center and it wasn't very satisfactory to Richard, I believe. And so um, we kind of started to look at the natural facing north and then starting to rotate the building 27 and a half degrees is what it came out to be to make an optimal kind of orientation of north facing skylights that would not have any untoward shadows on the piece during the day, maybe just a little bit early in the day and at the end of the day, different times of the year. That's it. So, and. As you can see, it's it's a pavilion, but it had significant disruption. And we have this um, remotely located vault, underground ducting. We have a uh, emergency generator with a tank. This actual building, uh, this piece actually is a radiating fan. It's actually a big piece of metal 
um, two pieces, one balanced on top of each other and propped by the actual building. And each piece is seven and a half feet tall, 40 feet long, two and a half inches thick, and just kind of freestanding with a dead load or a point load on that actual cross. Um, and so we regraded as well. We're at the bottom of the slope. We created this big curtain drain, relocated trees and built the trees back and started off on our studies of what the enclosure is and, the, and what the sun angles should be or the sun study and the sun skylight. And for the optimal illumination levels, we started looking at other pieces in the DIA. He had a show at the Gago scene as well uh, during our actual design development. This project took four years um, as well, even though it's such a small project. And our original idea was this kind of all glass skylight with tension members, but these micro louvers that would actually diffuse light in and we would have a light scrim underneath. And we thought we were done. We thought, oh, this is amazing. We're gonna have this beautiful subtle light that changes and there will be like a cloud of light over, over the top. And the client said, I wanna see out. <laughs> so we had to rethink the whole actual experience of the skylight and also the idea that there's two galleries. You come in on two sides, this is an actual bisected square with another bisection above you that was hanging. Um, so we, we decided that uh, we'd start to open up the actual kind of um, skylight to allow for views out. And we made some steady progression. We wanted to try to keep the glass on top only for snow and water and drainage and leaves. Um, and, but it started to become very costly. We we're talking to these sailboat, man, uh, sailboat fabricators and things like that. And it just started to get out of control. So we went back, we looked at just a, a simpler sawtooth skylight. And the last one is what you see in the iteration of all these lighting studies and skylight studies and the remote bolt and the little kind of return and um, supply ducts around the, the slot below. And so we did these lighting studies with, you know, some pretty um, climate studio, not climate, so this is Ecotech, but um, trying to figure out what's the optimal visual light transmission, uh, orientation, size, and then we'd run simulations um, that would actually measure the shadow, anything falling on our piece, what time, and we reorient the building again and again to make sure that it was working. And then also, talking to the client, knowing when he was up there, what days of the week he would usually, it's a weekend retreat. Um, and the time or the hours that he would actually be using it was one of the impetuses of the actual orientation. So, That's interesting. Okay. so one of those, and I think I know that, okay. So one of the tricky things about this project, we were prescribed a box, but we actually had to build the box while we were rigging the piece because the piece is not, it's not constrained by anything except for the walls. And it's a rail load, meaning it's just, if, if it's in balance, actually a person can hold it, but once it starts going, then that's it. So essentially we choreographed the sequence where the rigging happened and half built walls or openings that allow for the actual sculpture pieces to enter and partial walls are completed um, to allow for this kind of sequence rigging of bringing a plate in, lifting it up, bringing the other plate in, jamming it against the pre-finished corner and then finishing one part of the wall and then lowering another piece and then finishing the wall and then finishing the enclosure all during climate, um, a tempered temperature, temperature, uh, tempered weather. So, and the reason why, as I said, it is a um, um, radiating fan, it actually would contract and expand um, four or five millimeters or a little over a quarter inch, which would damage our finishes right away. So. Um, the sketch was about our ideas about how we actually finished and incorporated um, elements so that we can actually splice in the actual finish. We're using um, high performance uh, plasticboard, plywood, uh, very hard shore hardness EPDM, uh, li hydrated lime plaster that can actually span very long distances without actual control joints. 
And so you can see um, in some of these pictures where we're bringing in the plates in and starting to rig these kind of corners that are actually pre-finished and pre-fainted just for those pieces. And as we started to finish the building, then we thought it would be more of a daytime element. Of course, we had to think about a nighttime. A nighttime. The, um, it was always originally part of our actual ideas, but again, trying to use the natural skylight shape and the natural kind of north facing skylight um, kind of reflector to bounce light into the room. We actually did several mock-ups. We even commissioned it ourselves where we're using theatrical light shifting, light beam shifting film. We would do honeycombs and um, filtering light at the end so we wouldn't get this raking light against the actual skylight. And so we would try to feather in the light as much as possible to make it as natural as possible. And this is the actual piece. We're looking north in the north gallery or the gallery from the south looking north. This would be one of the times very early that you see shadow, but it wouldn't fall actually on the sculpture. This is coming in from the other side. The concrete work also, we consider we wanted low shrinkage concrete with macro fibers so that we wouldn't have any control joints. We had to burn off the fibers and then polish the floor. Um, and you can see the, the slot that we use for all the air conditioning. And one of the things that we felt very strongly about at the beginning of this project, Richard gave me a book on Jap Japanese joinery. And he said, what do you think? And it was a time when we were visiting the, it was after we visited the actual estate. And a lot of the actual buildings around the estate are reclaimed wood. It's a very woody estate. Um, I wasn't quite sure of Japanese joinery, but I knew that it, the building had to be wood. And so in Japan, there is this kind of, it's getting very popular now. There is a technique of yakisui or burning wood. It preserves the actual wood uh, from insects, also from moisture. You see it a lot on the coastlines of Japan. And it, it's quite stunning. It's not great against abrasion, but it does last if you just kind of keep it, but it actually patinas over time. So the idea was that we're entombing the Richard Serra project within a, a building that was climate controlled with backup actual generation and backup HVAC, but we're actually allowing for the facade to subtly change over time as we were actually incorporating the build, uh, the sculpture. So. Uh, here you could see even the patterning of the actual fasteners. We were looking actually at Japanese forged nails, um, they actually rust and expand and that's how they hold in the actual the nailing or the holding. Um, but you would see these little rust stains sometimes, which are quite beautiful for pe some people. Um, our, our client was intrigued, but he also was kind of taken back by the $35,000 for the actual nails. So we decided to go back and we, we looked at spanner bolts. Those are kind of like the, the double pronged um, spanner uh, turns or the actual nostril like things. And we aligned them, of course, like rivets and um, uh, we had them painted black as well as with all of our stainless steel and custom kind of um, hardware, so. So that's kind of the project. And I think I have a little video at the end you can look at, um, but I hope you enjoyed the talk. I'm sure there'll be questions. If we have time for questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. If we don't have time, thank you for joining us. So this was a day during that winter when we were just finishing, we we're still doing a little bit of um, punch listing and it snowed and we we're, we we're talking to our photographer. We we're like, Albert, you gotta go out there today. You have to go out there today. <laughs> so he went out there. You can see him in the background with his drone and he took these stunning pictures and this video.
a serious commitment. Mm -hmm. I guess the more we get it, the more. So thank you. Um, Hiroshi, congratulations. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, two quick comments. The museum you did in Wuzhen is stunning. I, I've been I've been to Wuzhen, and it's kind of the Venice of the East. I mean, it it really is a, a beautiful place, and your museum recreates the spatial experience of being in that place. Uh, the connection between the beautiful traditional stone buildings and the canals, um, and the Sarah project, the, the, the London Cross, um, it is, is kind of the opposite, where the, the, the art overwhelms the architecture, and in Mugen, the architecture supports the art. So congratulations. And um, if, you, if you had, I, I'd love to hear you just say, just give us a quick um, take on the interaction between what's in the building, what, what the building contains and what the building is. Um, it would be very interesting to hear that. Uh, I, I guess I'll start with the London Cross um, because actually uh, in, in a different way, contractually the building is actually the art piece, meaning the contract was that to the the sculpture is in actual space and he had to approve the actual space and the building as it is. And I think going back to working with him in Doha with the actual kind of pier um, and this project and actually subsequent to this, we're working with Richard again on another project, a very large project actually. Uh, I think he comes back to us because we work in the negative space or we, we are um, more experiential space because his pieces are experiential. It's not about something where you have to have a, a curator explain what it is. His pieces are spatial. And so what we're trying to do is to play up that actual experience without getting in the way. Um, and I think the London Cross does that, yet it also cannot be so I think it needs a certain amount of strength, even in the Doha Pier, that has to be a complement to his architecture, uh, his sculpture, which is architectural. And so I think he comes back, he came back to us, or he likes what we do because I think we, we very much complement the actual art and actually heighten the experience. We always think about the experience of the art. Um, as much as um, what we're doing architecturally or environmentally or whatever requirements we need to actually house the art or support the art. So, Great. Yeah. One, one more quick question about Sarah. Um, your building compresses the London Cross. It, it contains it beautifully. Uh, and uh, I, I'm thinking of the last time I went to Dia Beacon and saw his, uh, his one of his no torque way. ellipses. Yeah. Mm -hmm you know, constrained in this little tiny, uh, kind of a little hallway almost. And th that's where you get the, the power of those pieces. I'm just curious, um, I, I, I know this guy must be a friend, but, but I, I, t tell us a little bit about him. What's he like? What's he, uh, I'm sure he's hard to work with, but um, what's he like as a person and, and what's he like as a craftsman? Uh, you know, he, uh, from as far as we know, He's been very nice to us, and but he, you know, he has a reputation, um, and he's demanding, and you know immediately when you're in the room if he likes you or not. So <laughs> if you're, if he doesn't like you, you're not in the room. Um, and so I think um, he's very quick on likes and dislikes, but when he's intrigued, he'll give you the latitude and thinking about it. And when he, I think for us we've had this collaboration now, he really has this trust that um, endures, I guess. And that's, that's probably why we're working on this other project, which is a totally different project. It's an all glass project actually. 
um, um, in the middle of nature, you know, and I, I think working with them, it's always a collaboration, every artist. Um, um, I, I, you know, and art is, is creative endeavor of humans, right? Um, and so his pieces for me resonate and for most people because it's so powerful and experiential and spatial and it's in primitive and in a most powerful way. And that's, that's you know, it, that's a, it's, it's a great feeling to be near his art. And like in Dia, when you're up against it and you got the Robin Irwin glass and um, like some of the project with like the war working, he's like, I want to compress it more, you know? He wants you to be up against this piece. And so it's interesting to talk to. And he's very interesting to talk to. And he's someone um, that uh, we're very thankful that he's been very supportive of us. And we're, we love the challenge too, because it's not easy because we actually work with two clients then, or maybe more sometimes. Um, because it's, you know, Richard Sarah, the client, and then the collector, the client, or the foundation the client or and also the government or the community if it's a public building um I go to, I go to seattle a lot and his he has some a series yeah. of pieces um at the olympic sculpture park mm -hmm. uh Raceman in Freddy, seattle yeah. waterfront mm -hmm. and yeah. they're they're stunningly beautiful and you you get to walk right up to them and put your hands on them i mean you are you are uh, right there next to two inch thick rolled steel plate and, and there's something about that material that I've always loved. I think he's really kind of a magician. Yeah. Uh, it's really terrific. Um, one last comment I want to make is um, my, my um, I really appreciate the, the, the um, attention you guys give to craft and just the way things are going to fit together. Build it once, look at it, learn from it, and build it again. That, that's really, really smart. And um, I, it shows in your work. So um, Thank you. thanks a million for like raising Thank the you. bar in that, uh, that department. I think, uh, you know, Let's stop the screen crap. share. But, I'm sorry. Let's stop the screen share, please. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, we have another question sure. about skylight um, on the top with the snow. Does it somehow affect the the experience inside? So we actually have a heat trace system. Um, it's kind of a wired heating system, so there's no accumulation of the snow. Um, and the angle of the skylight, also, if you know, if it's three to twelve or et cetera, then you're dealing with trying to get rid of the snow. So it has no problems. With that. Uh, but we also did deal with the skylight system. The client wanted to change the color a little, so we had to investigate. Um, we always thought it should be very light and low albedo, um, but we looked at, um, then we installed the actual, more of a, a flat standing scene system that was a lighter gray, but we picked, chose a, a lighter warm gray um, that went back on there. So. Uh, do we have other questions? Peter, do you have other questions? No, I think we've successfully integrated the architecture and art in one in one piece. <laughs> Hiroshi, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Peter. much. Yeah. Really great work. Just thank fabulous. You very much. Really yeah. great to see you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Tony. Yes, Tony, thank you for hosting and inviting me and us. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We're signing okay. off now, but thank you all. And we'll have the recording online for those of you who missed part of it. We appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>